Welcome to Speaking Cinema, a series movie jibber jabber, a movie podcast coming to you live from a hijacked prisoner of transport plane high above Hollywood, California. Our hair is, to put it mildly, flowing beautifully. It's so long. It's so full. It smells like cigarette smoke and beer. It smells like Huckleberry. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Tumblr at Speaking Cinema every single Monday, iTunes, SoundCloud, and Stitcher. I am your host, Agent Jibber Jabber, DEA. With me today, as always, noted overactor, Kevin. That's me! This week on the Jibber Jabber, they were deadly on the ground, now they have wings! 1997's Con Air. This season, season nine, we're fulfilling a few fan requests. Can you believe we have fans? Can you believe it? I feel like you're you're too incredulous about that. Yeah, maybe. I, I, I don't get to see the numbers. Like you, you I you want to see the numbers? I mean, we could talk numbers. <laughs> this one coming from regular listener, friend of the show, Jenny. Jenny guest spot on episode number fifteen, Battleship. One of her one of her big favorites. And, and I'd say one of our better episodes, especially of those early bunch, which are rough. They are, they are Swiss cheese full of holes. Starring Nicolas Cage, John Malkovich, John Cusack, Dave Chappelle, Steve Buscemi, Rig Rames, Danny Trejo. Directed by Simon West, written by Scott Rosenberg, produced by Jerry Bruckheimer Films, distribution Buena Vista Entertainment, two in a row. Buena, Buena Vista's. Disney. Right in a row. Paint this podcast red. If you're not familiar, a disgraced former Army Ranger is set to go free on parole and is being transferred on the prisoner plane jailbird. But when a group of convicts take over the plane, he must fight for his life. Wow. Con Air. Wow. Inspired by a newspaper article written about a plane that transports inmates. Filming was done on Hollywood sound stages and at Wendover Airport in Utah. Kev, you ever been to Wendover Airport in Utah? Nope. Been to Salt Lake City Airport, though. How is that? They had, there's a Ben and Jerry's flavor called The Last Straw, and I've never found it anywhere except Salt Lake City Airport. What does it taste like? Incredible. Well, I mean... It's, but... it's like strawberry with strawberry fudge in it. Oh, interesting. And it was amazing, and I've never found it anywhere else. Mm. So there you go, Salt Lake City Airport. Director Simon West liked the location in Utah because it looked barren and alien like the surface of the moon, quote, unquote. Tragically, a welder named Pete Schwartz was killed on the set when one of the rig planes fell and crushed him. The film is dedicated to his memory. So when I was uh, in my one of my very first careers, when I tried to make it as a on-set schlub, I was uh, low, there's a music video shoot I worked on, uh, allegedly for no money. And I was loading up some stuff onto a truck, and uh, not a lot of people on this shoot, so like a lot of PAs doing this. Yep. Oh yeah. That, so, I've, you know, I've been there before. Working that that, that PA working the lift gate, just asking for trouble. So there was a uh, giant cart that had a bad wheel, and I'm like trying to like fucking push yeah. it in, and you know we're like rocking it and stuff. And then this old this this old timer that was like uh, we rented the generator from comes up to me. He's like, "Hey kid, you know." None of this shit's worth your life, kid. It's all insured. And then he winks at me, and, he, and to my memory, he just turned around, got in his truck, and drove away with the generator. <laughs> and I was just like, "What the fuck just happened?" Yep, that was your that was kind of a Mr. Miyagi moment right there. That's one of those stories where I think I have the memory of the story, but I have very few memories of the actual memory. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But uh, yeah, he just looked so that, at me. That's all that matters is that the story stuck with you. Mm-hmm. Isn't that why we talk about movies in the first place? Um. Yeah, that and all the money. According to many reports, this script was being updated almost daily, which led to many frustrations on the set. John Malkovich didn't like that he didn't know what his character was, where his character was going, what his character was doing. Dave Chappelle has claimed that he impri- improvised all of his lines in the movie, and John Cusack hates the film so much that he refuses to be interviewed about it. I mean, it implied like Dave Chappelle was exaggerating. Uh, Based on what we've, the research we've done for this episode, I believe him. Oh yeah, I totally believe him. And it's like, it's the 90s, you know what I mean? They're like, you're the comedic character, I assume, I've never seen this movie. You're the comedic character, do whatever, you say some funny stuff. Yeah. 
be funny, funny stand-up guy. Yeah. Despite all that, this film made $200 million globally during its theatrical run. In $97. That's a lot. That's a big chunk of change. As of recording, Con Air, Blu-ray, DVD, purchase and rental from digital HD providers. Not streaming anywhere currently, but, uh, you know, check your Roku. You never know. Kev, have you heard of this movie? Heard of it. I never watched it. Never saw it. Never got around to it. I also never saw it. And there was a long time, Kev, a long time, where I was like, damn, I want to watch that movie. Probably like three years. Yeah. Right? 97 to 2000. Where I was like, damn, I want to see that movie. They call that the Con Air itch. And then, and then it's kind of like, I think I stopped caring when I saw my first, um, who's the guy who directed The Killer? John Woo. I think I stopped caring when I saw my first John Woo movie, and I'm like, oh, this is... That's what you're looking for. This is what I'm looking for. Yeah. Nicolas Cage can't do what what these guys are doing. You want some killer and some hard-boiled... Yeah, yeah. Hard. When I saw hard-boiled, oh, that, that movie was like... That movie was just pure insanity. Oh, when he spins around on the fucking hospital bed and then does an overhead kick on the guy behind him. Mm-hmm. Tony Lung, baby, dude's incredible. When two, when two guys are running down a hallway and they're shooting through a glass plate window at each other, and they're both trying not to get shot, so they're just like throwing bullets. Oh, perfect. Oh man, Jenny picked this film for us. Why does she like it so much? That question we'll never know. Maybe she doesn't like it. Maybe the joke's on us. Did she uh, just come up to you at work or email or how? How did she? Yeah, tell so at, you? at the biscuit factory, she was like. Hey, I was talking about um, you know some some future episodes that are requested. She's like, you guys should do Con Air. I said, I love that movie, but she said in that way where you can't tell if like you love it knowing its faults or if you love it because you love it. Yeah. And you know we're all about not having any guilty pleasures on this show, so we did Battleship for God's sake. All right, I'll defend that movie for what it is: a vehicle for Rihanna. Let's talk Nicolas Cage. There's no way to transition into that. We just gotta really we just gotta throw that fish on the fucking counter. Nicolas Cage, do you like him? He's never boring. That's for sure. Is that true? <laughs> World Trade Center was pretty boring. That's for sure. You saw that movie? <laughs> it's not good. I I could have told you that already. Yeah. I find uh, I knew, and I, I find World it. <laughs> World Trade Center and Flight 93 to be in the in. The apex of bad taste. Yeah. That is like... Completely agree. Like, people look at me and they're like, why do you like this movie where this girl gets, you know, cut up, you know, by a, a guy in a mask with black gloves and, and a thing? And I'm like, because that's a fantasy, right? Like, Flight 93, that's a bizarre fantasy. Yeah, it truly is. Um, Nick Cage can be great when he wants to be, but doesn't always have that drive, but somehow is magnetic in almost every movie he's in. He's a, he's a confounding actor, right? He's very confounding. Confounding is the perfect word for him. I think people give him credit for some brilliant performances. I mean, Leaving Las Vegas, he's been riding that for a long time. And um, what's that one Charlie Kaufman movie where he is... Adaptation. Like, adaptation, but if you... Who directed that? Spike Jones. Spike Jones. Nicholas Cage said, I didn't know what I was doing in that movie. Spike Jones said, do it this way, and I did it that way. So... And you got a really trusted director to just, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger and James Earl Jones did the same thing about His, John Melius. It's like, he told me, turn left, look here, breathe this many times, say the line this way. And it's like, you really got to trust somebody to just do that. For know? sure. But it doesn't give you acting credit when yeah, you do that. You know. We had a, it's you on screen, though. It's you doing it. It's true. We have a mutual friend that I went to college with. I think you know who I'm talking about. Oh, allegedly. Who <laughs> unironically thought Nicolas Cage was great. Like, he's like, 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 as if he, it's like, you know, actors of our time, Clooney, uh, DiCaprio. Brad Pitt, DiCaprio, Cage. And I'm like, <laughs> one of these things, not, not like, like the other. other. I'm like, uh, have you seen The Wicker Man? Have you seen Next? <laughs> Have you seen National Treasure? Actually, I like National Treasure. I think you, I think that's the perfect intersection of Bizarro Cage to... Yeah, yeah. But I, I just think that he, he seems to be his own worst enemy. I like the idea of an eccentric dude, but maybe he just doesn't... I don't know if his people don't have the taste. I don't know if he doesn't have the taste. He just seems to be, like, 
one step away. I always think he's like one step away project wise from like, like why aren't like why aren't and maybe at this point it's too late and he, his reputation is is trashed. You know what I mean? Yeah. But it's like why aren't you in some bizarre like all the things Johnny Depp gets? Like why aren't you trying for that? He was also very good in Kick Ass, though I will say he was great in Kick Ass. He's brilliant in Matchstick Man. That is a great performance mm-hmm. that he throws on there. But then there's like a billion like using that movie like Left Behind, that one exactly. movie, like, that ho- Home Invasion exactly. with Nicholas Ca- with uh, Nicole Kidman. Why does he have to be in Left Behind, like some shitty faith based fucking Kirk Cameron thing? You mm-hmm. know, it's like you don't need to do that. Well, maybe like, maybe he doesn't maybe, need to do that. Maybe he's got to pay for those dinosaur skulls. Also, uh, I, I remember telling that story to Emily. Where he, in the story, if anyone doesn't know, he bought a dinosaur skull and I think it's him or his kid dropped it or something and it broke, so he buried it in his backyard. And I remember Emily, uh, she's like, like, oh yeah, because that's a good idea. Why not bury it in a museum, you idiot? <laughs> I was like, yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> you know, like, they, they put that T Rex skull back together from, from Montana, they could probably fucking figure this shit out. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, he's just, um, he's well, a weird guy. Like you said, his own worst enemy. And he doesn't need to be. And I feel like there's something he that... doesn't need to do like shitty bank robbery movies. It's like you can work with Werner Herzog. Like make like ten movies. With well, that's Herzog, the thing. He was in that. Know? He was in that. Um, that remake of uh, Bad Lieutenant. Yeah. But, and... but what's funny is that never started as a remake of Bad Lieutenant. They just slapped that title on it. Oh really? Yeah. Did you, did you know that? I did not know. That. See, so, you always seem okay. So here's my point. He always seems to be one step off, right? Like that ghost. That Ghost Rider two movie. Should have been awesome. It was the guys who did Crank. Yeah. But it's like, then you find out the studio didn't want to let them go nuts. And it's like, you have Nicolas Cage. You have the guys who made Crank. They're containing how nuts it is just to be functional human beings. Exactly. Let them go. Put at least a little bit of that on the screen. You guys, you had Ildred Ildred Alvis in that movie. He doesn't know what to do. (laughs) It's like one step away, right? And like that Drive Angry movie with Amber Heard, I believe, Amber Heard. It's like that should have been like one of these joyously like camp movies, right? Like Uh like a grindhouse kind of a thing. Just they try and make these generic sort of basic things. So maybe maybe the maybe what we figured out here is maybe the world's not ready for Nicolas Cage. It's Nicolas Cage's world, we're all living in it. And he he's toning himself down to fit what he thinks we can handle. And I tell him, don't do that. Well, you know, you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't, I suppose. <laughs> the 90s, Kev. We grew up in the 90s. We were there. Our formative years. Churned out a lot of action movies. Big stars. High concepts. Weren't often franchises. Kind of like the guy's the franchise, right? John claude Van Damme's the franchise. We don't need to make a sequel to Kickboxer, although we're making that now. You know, we, we'll go on to the next thing. Big budget, big talent, big explosions, big guns, big car chases, madness. Cobra. Are you a fan of that time? But, but, and, but, you know, let's refresh it. Let's refresh it. We, we haven't done this in a long time, Kev, but you're insisting on doing it, and wordlessly, I'm going to talk you down off the ledge. It's time for a little what, this movie? A little rapid fire. Okay, what? All right. Well, you know, whatever, whatever, whatever. It's all the same. What, what this rapid fire? We're gonna name some movies and we're gonna just spitball what we what our experience with it. Have you seen it? Do you like it? Whatever. Yep. True Lies. Yes, like it. As a kid, I thought it was too stupid. As an adult, I can appreciate you, you what the embrace the stupidity. Face off. Fun time. As a kid, I loved it. As an adult, it's <laughs> stupid as fuck. Broken Arrow. Um, I've only seen it once when I was a kid. So I don't remember much of it. I remember a guy gets killed because he gets a flashlight to the throat. Yes, that's all I remember. Uh, as a kid, that this movie was. Amazing, and, and to think that this is how '90s it is. This movie is led by the two biggest stars in the world at the time, John Travolta and Christian Slater. Christian Slater. <laughs> Where happened? Uh, he's on um, Mr. Robot now. That's true, and he was in uh, Large Von Trier's Nymphomaniac. Oh, very so, good. Yeah, yeah. Full frontal, Demolition Man. Always terrible. Always I, I, terrible. I never liked Demolition Man. Air Force One. And the, and the game was shitty, too. Oh, yeah, like, for sure. like, Super Nintendo game. Air Force One's fun. Air Force One, always great. It's a good time. Under Siege. Tommy Lee Jones is underrated in that movie. 
Hmm. Never but, seen it. But boy, you really watch Steven Seagal, and you can tell, like, why is this guy? Anything. He's not really doing any of the action things that he should be doing. You know, Point Break, a classic, a damn classic, awful. Just, <laughs> I, I just it. recently watched uh, while waiting for the night of to come on HBO. They have the remake of Point Break on. Oh man, is it terrible? <laughs> I hear it has like. There's CGI in it that's like Sharknado level. I hear it that, is bad. I hear that it, it's not as bad though as the trailer would make you think it is. Um, I disagree. It's uh, pretty terrible. Uh, fair enough. <laughs> uh, but, 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 The Rock. Fun movie. Loved it as a kid. Loved it. Last Boy Scout. Never saw it. You know, I've never seen that either. Tony Scott film. Never Executive seen. Decision. Not good. Which one was that? That's uh, that's got Kurt Russell, our boy Kurt Russell. Uh, it's on an airplane. Oh, no. I love that movie. And, and the, here's what's funny about it. Steven Seagal is in a supporting role. Yes. Man, but he thought he was going to be the lead right, in the movie. Right, right. So. What? You, you, you get, I'm about to lead in this movie? Then what, how did I even sign on? What do you mean? What do you mean I die? I'm going to take these bagels and I'm going to leave. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go pray. I love I love that movie. The Fugitive. Um, You know, I, I don't know if I've ever seen The Fugitive. Believe it or not. It's Another a, one with Tommy Lee Jones. It's a good movie with a villain that has no motivation. All right. Bad Boys. A fun time. Bad Boys Although, 1 is painfully boring. Yeah. Bad Boys 2 is what you think Bad Boys 1 is. Exactly. Bad Boys 2 is like three hours of just gorging on steak, you know? And mm-hmm. like not even the best steak in the world, but it's still good steak. And mm-hmm. it's... And you feel, it's a real Mongolian barbecue. You feel disgusting afterwards, but you can't wait to do it again. Speed. A classic. Yeah. Speed is great. Really good. Leon the Bra- The, the la- bus that couldn't slow down. Uh, and last but not least, Leon the Professional. I think the one that just skirts that level of high art. Yes. Like, just under that level of masterpiece. It's like interesting. It's, it's pretty iconic, What they, some stuff they pull off in that. It's interesting, because I think if you were thinking of 90s action movies, you'd be thinking much more in the vein of Face Off, Broken Arrow. For sure. Um, more than you would something like The Fugitive, which is much more of a thriller. Yeah, that's like more of an adult. It's like your parents, you got a babysitter because your parents went and got, see The Fugitive, mm-hmm. you know. So do you miss do you miss the '90s action movies? For me, it's kind of a weird relationship because these movies were kind of forbidden fruit to me because they were all these R-rated movies and my parents wouldn't let me watch them. But it's like you know you go over to the cousin's house, you go over to the friend's house for a sleepover, and they have a VHS copy of The Rock, and that's the first time you see it. You know, so for me, it was always these things where. You held them in such high regard because you just couldn't have them, you know? And some you watch, it's like, wow, that was really stupid. Why did I ever want to see that broken arrow? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Other ones, it's like, oh my god, this is everything I need right now. Face off. Yeah, um, the, and I think that tonally there, there's a lot to deal with. You know what I mean? There's a, they're all over the place tonally, right? Like... And I think they all get the, they all have the reputation. I mean, you know, it was funny about our list. Schwarzenegger's not even on it at all. True Lies. Oh, I guess True Lies. But, but that's it, though. Mm-hmm. You know, that was like his one big, you know, if you don't count Terminator 2, which is a franchise movie. It's like, that's kind of his one big 90s action movie. And then there's Last Action Hero, but that's a comedy. Right. I think, and I think what you want overall is cohesion. I think something off of our list, uh, Air Force One has a cohesion to it, right? You just, it, the movie is what it is, right? It's not trying to be anything other than what yeah. it is, which is like this, th- this awesome thriller. Same thing with like all of the good, I mean, I remember The Rock. It's like, there's like this biological element. It's like these guys are doing bad, the, the villains are doing bad things, but they're doing it for a good reason. Like they're, yeah. they, they got fucked, so they're taking their revenge and you feel bad for them, but they, you know, they're doing the wrong thing. You know, there's this element of like, you have this guy who, who broke out and now he's, you know, there's a cohesion to that that I recall. Maybe it doesn't hold up, but that's what I want. And looking forward to the movie that we're going to watch, that's what I want out of it, is I want a cohesive vision of something. Yeah. These rewrites that happen every day on the set... We'll see uh, if they come true. Maybe maybe it's a Jaws scenario where it's like, hey, we rewrite it every day, 
if we're missing a scene, we could just rewrite it that day and, and, and go and shoot it. Yep. I think for me, it's... I miss the days when you could throw big money at something that you didn't have to try and franchise to death. You know, like like you said, the actor was the franchise. Mm-hmm. And that's what you're throwing the big money at. Mm-hmm. And just, you know, getting good talent, not being afraid to go with these big balls-to-the-wall set pieces, doing these ideas that are... Most of them are kind of silly if you just look at it on paper. But... They also don't apologize for just being a movie, too. You know, it's like, face off, Broken Arrow, they're not going to change the world. And they're not trying to. They just want to blow shit up and have a good time. And mm-hmm. but spend, there's, there's a way spend to, somebody else's money and make a whole bunch more. There's a way to do that well, and there's a way to do that not well. Oh, well, for sure. You know, I'm not saying all of these movies are Stone Cold Jams, but it's, you know, they, they're always, it's that element we just don't really get anymore these days it's like the action movie has to be sort of this under the radar low key type thing or very martial arts heavy which is is cool as hell but it's like this kind of movie just doesn't really exist anymore mm. yeah, I, think it's, well, I think it's just too bad and well, somehow I never saw Con Air so well, well let's watch this movie and we'll see if We'll see if we if this nostalgia you're feeling is something that you know will permeate through the, the your experience of the movie, or if you know maybe the '90s should we should just nail that coffin shut and pile more dirt on top. Yep. So here we go. Here we go. And we're back. We're back. Kev, how'd you watch the movie? Amazon Prime rental, four dollars. Spending that cheddar. It's got to you know it's not streaming anywhere. I didn't have the disc. Wasn't going to be able to get it in time for this podcast. I got a pony up. Took a, took a walk to my local library. Got it on DVD. Mm. Let me talk about my DVD experience, Kev. Oh, boy. My movie, a widescreen image that was letterbox, letterbox and pillar, pillar box. box. So it's a poster oh, stamp. Oh, no. So I had to overscan. Thank God my TV had to overscan. Yeah. And then I had a little bit of a bar, but that's it. Yeah. Still, though, the letterbox, pillar box, there is nothing worse on this planet. Also, I knew a girl in college who uh, said that she didn't, you know, like when you watch a movie on widescreen, when yeah. you have like a 4 by 3 TV and you have like, yeah, the yeah. boxes, she goes, I don't like the boxes because it's distracting. And I'm like, it's distracting. You know nothing. You don't like movies then. Yeah. Get out of here. So you wrote this um, this format for us, Kev. Thank you for that. Yeah. Um, one of your questions that you, that was lower on here, you know, sometimes we get to questions after we talk you about know. our initial thoughts. Well, I'm, I feel like the, that question needs to be asked now. Right, right. And the question you. is, did the knowledge that constant rewrites were uh, were done show through on screen, or was everything pretty smooth and cohesive? The answer is... It did show. Yeah, it did. <laughs> and this Always is... it comes through. This is, for the second time in a row, I'm going to, usually I give it to you, but I'm going to take this really quick. Balls in your Um, This is a 90s goofball comedy living as an action movie through the eyes of a 1990s era old man. And I mean that in the meanest way I could say it. True lies without half the charm, basically. Without True lies is a romantic comedy. But True Lies is With a, a gigantic budget and a hairier jet. Right. <laughs> True, but True Lies is a romantic comedy that knows it's a romantic comedy. Yeah, yeah. I think this movie thinks it's the most awesome action movie ever, but it doesn't realize what it's doing at all. Yeah. Where it's like, it's just the most old man movie. The racial jokes, the one liners. It wouldn't be a 90s action movie without a gay stereotype, right? <laughs> it would not. And somehow the movie supports locking up prisoners and throwing away the key and at the same time acknowledges injustice in the criminal justice system. It's what, all over the place. What a tightrope to walk. And in and, <laughs> and the last 20 years have not been kind to this movie at all. I don't think so. Like the and, and Kev, I think the, this is not summarized better than this. Right, and I'm gonna let me just get into this real quick. First thirty seconds of the movie is literally an ad for the Army Rangers. Yeah. Like if you cut it there and you said join the army and you said army dot com, that would be a with, commercial with a Powers Booth voiceover. Right, you know what I mean? Like, yep. 
it's it's like what what, what is this? Mm-hmm. Then minute two, crappy pop song comes in. Uh, yeah. How do I live without yeah. you? How do I live without you? A lot of late night drives. Listen to that song. Um, the only song on AM radio. Right. <laughs> and then a terrible logo pops up. And kind it doesn't of, get any better. Kind of a tonal logo where it's just like, you know, Army Rangers, pop song, and then it's like, Connor! It's like, you did not prepare me for that that title and that logo in the slightest. No. No, you did not. <laughs> when we see Nick Cage in prison with his long hair, long hair, a signifier of how much time has passed, Emily... I have so many thoughts. Oh, oh boy, Emily, watch this. Oh yeah, <laughs> Emily, watch this. Did I say that? No. No, yeah. Oh, this is gonna be fun. Uh, wait, that it's an Emily quote episode. I uh, can't wait. I have so many thoughts. None of them good. All about his hair. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. It's a uh, li- 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 spoiler alert. She was very, very not into. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks, Jenny. Hey, I don't know. I, I, I mean, she's not here to defend herself, but yeah. uh, I just, oh man, like I'm, another question you posed w- was: Is this an iconic '90s action movie or forgettable? It's not forgettable. It's not forgettable. It's iconic for all the wrong reasons. Because this, do you is, think this is where the '90s action movie died? This is, this is. I'm not gonna say this movie killed it, but this movie is why it eventually went away, right? There were, and it's three things. It's bad action, racial jokes, and stupid humor. And the attempt to be... How macho this movie attempts to be... Ha, there's no words. There's no words in the English language for how... To say this is a meathead movie <laughs> is... At least meatheads think about sports. You know what I mean? Like, this is... It's unbelievable literally unbelievable in the literal definition of unbelievable of of i don't believe how me how macho this movie is trying to be when they say make america great again they want america to be con air it's it's (laughs) oh man and the thing about it is and it's why it's a mess it's trying to be broad and it's trying to be edgy in that non-edgy hollywood way that like really was prevalent in the 90s and early 2000s you know like the underworld kind of movies where it's like she's wearing all black that's edgy and it's like no it's not and it's like oh it's not he's bald and he's wearing a fucking grate on his face because he's he's a bad guy yeah it's like what why yeah Yeah. we don't know why we're told he's a bad guy right and you're talking about Steve Buscemi's character yes yes like the hyper masculinity it's grating in this movie right like Poe is Joe Sixpack. He reads in prison. He's reading Off Road Mag. His wall on his prison cell is all pictures of his families and pictures of cars. He loves his family. He served in the army. Southern guy. Got in jail on a bum rap for defending his wife. His wife's faithful to him. She's she stayed true all these years. He he's been in prison. To his daughter. He writes to his daughter to, every day. To his hummingbird. And. It's just like, it's just such this this view of like perfect masculinity that's just like so heteronormative, so white, so American in a way that like no one is. Yeah, and I feel like the movie shows you if if he wasn't if they cut out the whole first scene, the movie would have been better because when they show him, he comes home from serving. Two country boys give him shit for for serving, which is like. In what bar in the <laughs> South is that a thing? You know what I mean? Those guys are practically... They, you pussies are why we fucking lost Vietnam. And, like, those guys wouldn't admit that we lost Vietnam. Like, what are you talking about? No, they wouldn't. And then... and then <laughs> Pre-9-11 America, folks. Yeah, right? And then he, Nick Cage gives him a dirty look, and the wife's like, Hey, I don't want to see that guy again. So then we get the idea that Nick Cage is, like, kind of like a bad guy, or he can go to a bad place and then he he beats up this dude for no like they, they, they call him out he's in his car he's literally Kev you saw this movie <laughs> the door was open he had one foot in the car the way you do when you enter a car and they're like hey there's that guy and he 
gets out of the car and he slams the door and he's like, I'm going to fight three men. It's like, you could have walked away from that very easily. So like the way that scene is shot is making sense. If the movie just started with him in prison and you just, you just voice over or something tells you like, I got a bad rep on a, on a self-defense thing and I went to, to, to jail for it. It just make way more sense. I agree. And, um, and how 90s action movie is it? They can't just have a scene of him fighting three dudes. It's got to be in the rain mm. with these big oil rigs and flames shooting out of the oil rigs. It's like, that scene probably cost like a million dollars. You know? That scene cost one the witch. It's, <laughs> exact. And like, you know, it's like in True Lies. It's the scene where he like tries to catch her in the trailer or whatever. I think it's the trailer or the house. And yeah, it's like all these helicopters and a bulldozer and it tears the wall down and it's like that scene doesn't need to be that elaborate, but some coked up producer just threw well, but, a shit ton of money at it. And that's kind of what's charming about all, it. <laughs> all the credit in the world to True Lies though, it's like but True Lies knows what it's True trying Lies to True Lies knows what it's trying to Right, do. like the Pelican landing on like that's supposed to be funny. Exactly. And but that's a but then like you know what I'm saying? Like 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 I'm gonna catch my daughter with a Harrier jet. Come to daddy! Yep. You're like that's like that's supposed to be a thing. But that's the difference between James Cameron and Simon West. Yes. Yeah. That's the difference. And uh, speaking of the difference, every male in this movie is trying to shoot off one-liners. And it reminds you, just in the same way you just brought up with the flames, it reminds you why one-liners die. Because we look back at one-liners now, because we watch, you know, you watch, we watched for this fucking podcast, we watched um, True Lies. And we're like, these one-liners are funny. Uh, you know? Last Action Hero. Last Action Hero. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I got True Lies on the brain. Last action hero. Like, these are these one liners are funny. This is like, why do we get rid of this? And you watch this movie and you're like, oh, because when it's not done in a wink way, it's a cheese grater against your forehead. Just yeah. gr- you know, oh man. And, uh, and so and yeah, what line has endeared in this movie? Put the bunny in the box. Has that, that endeared? I I've heard that more than a few times. I was on a college football forum earlier today and somebody threw out a con air reference that's right i go on college even, football forum. yeah I, was, I don't want to comment on that part yeah, of it just, but um even if i was to give you that Kev, I, i'm gonna give you that i'm gonna say that that line has endured and is a beloved line i'm gonna i'm gonna give it to you freely if that's true the rest of the one-liners of which there are 300 are dumb kill scenes kill the flow of dialogue and Add nothing to the movie but an attempt at wit, which they do not accomplish. Don't move or the bunny gets it. It's like, what good would shooting the bunny do? And, you know? and, and he I sure got... goes through a lot of shit to save that bunny. Sorry, boss. There's only two men I trust. One of them's me, and the other's not you. Contingency plans for this don't exist. A situation like this has never been con- contemplated. Well, then you better start contemplating, because this is a situation that needs to get unfucked right now. Call me, folks. <laughs> <laughs> and then my favorite one, uh, one my favorite one, uh, Johnny23, do you know who I am? Ugly all day? <laughs> <laughs> there it is. Oh, actually, and this this is my true favorite one, because this one, this one it doesn't, like, uh, so the one, the one Malloy, what is he? One of these sociology majors who thinks that we're responsible for breeding these animals. And then, uh, what's his face as a character? Um, uh, he played Larkin. John Cusack. Cusack Turner. says, no, but I could point a few fingers if it would make you feel comfortable. What does that even mean? <laughs> what, are you, what are you talking about? What are you, what are you talking about? So it's just like, I feel like it's just, it's just all of the humor in this movie is like old man humor where it's like, Hey, we can make fun of race stuff. It's the '90s, and like, don't you hate this bureaucracy? God, it ruins everything. You know what I'm talking about? Look at the gay guy. He just wants a dress and to prance around in the dress. Right. And don't you hate it when your butler gets smuts on the fender of your old time Duesenberg? <laughs> it's just, oh man. And I feel like I'm I'm power talking, Kev. So feel free to interrupt here, but. Is there a likable character in this movie? One would say Nicolas Cage would be your candidate. The answer to that is, though, is he is not. He is not likable. He truly isn't. You know. Also, another time for Emily quote. he brought on this whole thing to himself. Right. Could have walked away. Could have walked away. Emily's quote. I hate him. I really don't like him. I thought I did. 
I don't. <laughs> I mean, I hate to be this guy, Kev. Because I, I don't, be I don't, that guy. I don't oh, like this criticism normally. That accent is terrible. Oh, it, it's so all, it's all over the place. Sometimes he sounds just like Nicolas Cage. Other times he talking about his hummingbird, and it's just sometimes he's Alabama, sometimes he's Texas, sometimes he's Georgia. It's like. Yeah, it's the, just, and the cadence is terrible. Sometimes it's way too slow. Yeah, and the movie has no idea what he wants him to be. He doesn't need to be southern. They made him southern. That's fine. But then he's like really smug and judgy. Like when the plane gets taken, they cut to him and he's just like shaking his head, like oh, I knew it. You know, it's like what? And then when the DEA, and then a like, tear rolls down. His right. Eye. <laughs> and then when the DEA agent gets caught and and then gets shot, he gives him. He tries to talk him down. He's like. You don't want to do this. And the guy's like, shut up. And then he gets shot. And he looks at Nicolas Cage. He, he's shaking his head. He's like, you didn't help him, you fucking asshole. What was he supposed to do? <laughs> but then he's also supposed to be Joe Sixpack with his fucking wife and his kids and his trucks. And he's also supposed to be beautiful, which has this bizarre, bizarre shot of him getting out of yeah, the, the plane. The, the, <laughs> and it's like, he's just, the wind he, and anyway. he's like smiling like, ah, like a fucking... It's shampoo like a, commercial. It's a terrible as it's sad. It's yeah. Just like, it, man, it's ugly Nicolas Cage and his shitty southern hair. Yeah. Just blowing. The like, Fabio like shot has no movie. business. Yeah. Has no business in the movie. <laughs> oh, man. A glamour shot of shitty Nicolas Cage. I would argue the only likable character is the female guard. Yeah. She's the only one who seems somewhat competent. And then, um, yeah, she gets away in the end and kind of has some nice parting words but doesn't fuck up the family relationship yeah she's not and i'm like thank god they didn't sexualize that relationship thank you and and boy they could have this movie kev i don't know if you noticed this or not (laughs) this movie is racist (laughs) is it now (laughs) this movie is racist you mean you mean black people are just uh you tell me they're not just sexualized criminals is that what you're telling me because this movie was a documentary. I'm not well, sure if you knew that or not. Defenders of this movie, <laughs> Defenders of the movie say that, that his best friend is black, right? Yeah. And he's got the beatus. And and Nick Cage is giving him the snowballs, the 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 yeah. strawberry snowballs. So it's like I think Nick Cage gave him diabetes. <laughs> or he's right. certainly not helping with it. <laughs> I didn't think about that. He probably did give him diabetes. And you know, he's a quiet, obedient southern guy, right? He's just kind of like and that's fine. The problem is it, it exists in the context of that's what a good black guy is. And the bad black guy is a crack dealing, you know, uh, Ving, smart ass. Yeah, Ving, D- Dave Chappelle or Ving Rhames where he's a psycho Who is a militant black character, which is such a terrible cliche when it comes to like demonizing black people is the black militant. Yep. Right? Because it's like. It's, it's this false idea that there's a black uprising right around the corner and that the Black Panthers were the KKK but in reverse. When it's like, the Black Panthers did not... I'm not saying Black Panther people didn't commit crimes. They did, right? But not on the organized level of terrorism that was like the KKK. And I remember... I don't know if this was with you, but as a kid, it's like... When it's like, Malcolm X remember the Black Panthers and the kids would be like, what's the Black Panthers? And it's like... And, you know, our white teachers had no frame of reference. It's same thing with science. It's like... Well, like, how does the Big Bang, like, why, why is it the Big Bang? Like, how do we know? You know, and they're like, they're, it's just a theory. We don't know. Some lady said that to us. It's like, no, it's, wow. a, it's a Doppler effect, you fucking crazy yeah. no good. To call it a theory, like, yeah, it's a theory, but a theory in science is the same way gravity is a theory. Right. It's like there's so much credible evidence, you just can't prove it definitively. Right. So it's like, so... With the it's like with the black it's like he's a militant black and it's like those militant blacks yep. you know the bane of our and American we, economy. And if we give them free health care, they're gonna take over. By God, yeah. One well, thing like most of what the Black Panthers did was like you know trying to help like the inner community and organize and you know I don't, it's just I'm not saying that they were fucking you know saints, but they weren't also they also weren't the insurgency that this movie would have you believe. They weren't lynching white people. Exactly. So. Oh, so, and, and this, this movie, I think when it officially loses its goddamn mind <laughs> is when Ving Rhames' character is whipping his fellow inmates yeah, to uh, pull the plane out of the, the... Oh, boy. That is just like... <laughs> oh, boy. That is just like... 
next level bonkers. Yep. Like that's when it uh that's when it gets rough. No question about it. <laughs> and so, I mean, is there any other racist stuff that you want to point out that yeah, you know what I mean? Again, Dave Chappelle's the jive talking crack dealer who's just kind of a screw up. And, and so also, he's a crack dealer, but like why is he on this plane with a bunch of these psycho killers? Yeah. Exactly. So Danny Trejo is like the rapist of Mexican. Like he's literally the rapist and he has a tattoo for each one of his babies. Oh, each one of his convictions. His convictions. And if they knew how much I really did, I'd be Johnny 600. Fucked up. Yes. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Normally I ask what doesn't work, but for me it's everything. And, and I will say, I would go so far as to say, with prejudice, this is the worst movie we've ever done on this show. All right. You say it was... Bone Tomahawk. I'd say it was probably Batman vs. Superman, but yeah, now I mean, it's back to... Which my review does not reflect my thoughts on that movie correctly. Now it's this. Con Air, huh? I'd say this... Because this movie... Because say what you want about um, Bone Tomahawk. It is... You could say it's not well made. You could say that it's not to your liking... It is a one man's vision, the writer director's vision of what he wanted to sure. do, and whether or not he competently did that or not, that's uh, that's what we talked about. For sure, we revisit our episode for sure. This movie is no man's vision of nothing, and and just jokes for no reason. Steve Buscemi's character for no reason, with a redemptive arc that, that goes that, nowhere, like for no reason. Uh, with a redemptive arc that makes no sense, that like has nothing to do with anything. The only thing I can say positive about this movie is that there is some dialogue between Steve Buscemi's character and him that is funny, where he's they're like, "Can you please not talk to me? I'm having a bad day." And then Steve Buscemi says some stuff, and he's like, "It's my daughter's birthday." birthday. <laughs> I laughed out loud at that line. That was a great line. My daughter's birthday. I agree with every point you're saying that we've talked about up to this episode. Can I also add one more thing before you? Absolutely. Uh, the government has all authority in the world and none of it at the same time. It is an old man's view of the government, right? Which is, the government can't get anything done when we need them to, yep. yet they're always in the way of me. But well, one man with a gun can do it, you know? Right. They made five Death Wish movies about that. Yeah. And five Dirty Harry. <laughs> it's like, the and it's like, Cusack has no authority. He's begging people to help him. It's as if the DEA and FBI are independent contractors, so like, Pretty hey, much. would you, would anyone here in this room like to like to go bust a criminal with me over over twenty five minutes away by car? Nah, nah, we're good. Yeah, that's 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 the clout the FBI has in this okay. world. <laughs> okay, I, I got more things to say, but you say your thing. I agree with everything we've just talked about. We got some racist stuff. We got some clunky one-liners. We got all kinds of issues with this movie. I still kind of enjoyed it. <laughs> oh, Kev. Oh, Kev, no! I still had fun watching it. Well, you can see this is the worst movie we've done. In terms of just, like, overall quality, sure. I'll say it's probably what... It doesn't feel horribly competently made. When you think about it, there's really not a lot of action in this movie for its two hour runtime, but it's thought of as you know an action movie and yeah there's some very questionable stuff in it that doesn't make you feel good in the moment would one of those things be the fact that like the climax of the movie is when the plane crashes and they just announce two seconds before it crashes that oh by the way we're out of gas and we'll never make it to an airport so we're gonna have to put this thing down on the strip yep here we go got a christy quote for that oh very good watch this at least they're near the shitty end of the strip. <laughs> <laughs> so only like Circus Circus and the Flamingo got fucked up. None of the nice hotels. Mm-mm. So. Mm-mm. Um, but goddamn, if I didn't just have fun watching this movie. Yeah, I, don't know, I don't know what you're doing it's to me It's like right eating now. a double, like, it's eating like a triple cheeseburger from Fat Burger. You don't feel good afterwards, but in the moment, it just, it was enjoyable. Uh, what about and, and I hate myself for it, but goddamn it, I enjoyed it. Uh, <laughs> I just like how can you get over like for a movie about planes? It's aboutness is planes. There's no logic to planes. Helicopters, 
catch up. Uh, you know, we're chasing planes with helicopters. Yeah. What? Yep. What what what? In, in what world? Like jumbo jets? Like this this thing's supposed to be huge and can supposedly fly fast. It goes fifty. It, it's as if it's like a truck in traffic yep. going like fifty miles an hour. Yep. They have no trouble knowing where it is. They catch it immediately. Yep. And yeah, and like the the whole transponder thing is like, you know that plane's not going that way. It's like there's plenty of evidence to the contrary that. The FBI told you it doesn't go that way, but the DEA is going to suddenly have jurisdiction. You know, yeah. it's like there's all that shit, and I completely agree. And, uh, and, uh, listen, even if you had fun, I enjoyed it when I watched it. <laughs> even if you had fun with the first half, and I can see how someone who is in a good mood could have fun with the first half. Not me, but someone. That airplane landing sequence was so. Bobo. In uh, where they land on Vegas or when yeah. they land in the desert? Vegas. In Vegas. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> there's it, there's some very bad rotoscoping, some very bad model work, some very bad CGI. And like, it's so budget. It's the most inelegant editing of action. When we talk about Mad Max, right? We talked about how the editing is just selling you on everything that's happening. They don't shoot shit. They just shoot the pieces and then they just assemble it and it looks perfect. This is the polar opposite of that, right? It's like the plane's crashing and so see all this destruction and then all you just see is is a is a full plane parked in front of a building. You know what I mean? Not fucked up at all. Yep. No no trail of of destruction. It's just the plane set that's in Universal Backlot 2. You know? Yeah. It's just plopped on the Vegas soundstage. You know. It's just there. And is this movie aware that the guy goes to jail for arguably a justifiable homicide in the end is involved with a catastrophic event that at, on its best day killed like hundreds of people? Yeah. Assuming that the city was evacuated the city was not, it was not. it's Vegas <laughs> so he's never evacuated Ugh. and then C. Buscemi in the, I mean I can't even I'm, I'm, I'm Buscemi's out. character you can completely cut out he, uh, he does, and the scene with the girl is just so well and the fact that they imply like oh he killed her cause he comes back and he's got blood on him but then the girl's okay and then the, the teacup is, is broken yep it's like None of that. And in the end... And they labor so much on it, and none of it works. And in the end, um, he's, like, like gambling, and it's like he got away. Yeah. Playing craps. Playing my game. (sighs) Also, I'm just going to get straight into my nitpicks here. Do it. Shitty slow-mo. Gross. Lots of shitty slow-mo. Especially during that first fight sequence that don't earn it at all. That's of Nick Cage way too close to explosions, but unscathed. You know, like when he jumps through the door in there. Also, and... also in that whole scene, he like he like opens the door like, huh, what's going on out here? <laughs> a plane. <laughs> it's like he's so ineffectual in that whole sequence. Yep. Uh, dated reference to hard copy and Geraldo. Oh yeah, gotta get those nineties cameos. I'm gonna show you that God exists. What the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> the fight scene in the in the plane that's like underneath the plane where they're all hunched over is so inelegant. Yeah. Not good. And also, the first half of this movie, every gunshot is like a fucking horror movie where they explode yeah. with blood. <laughs> and by the time they get to the end, they're like, oh, we're bored. We don't want to do that anymore. It takes too too much work. Yeah. God, we haven't even gotten to John Malkovich yet in our uh, discussion here. I mean, he's, he is trying. He, he does seem to be the one guy who's trying. Also, and apparently, he was very frustrated, too, on set with the whole not knowing where his character's going. And I mean, that's one of the cool things. Also, Danny Trejo with no beard. And Danny Trejo is trying, too. Yeah. But, I mean, he's given the thinnest <laughs> the thing to work with. The most role yeah. that he could possibly ever have. And it is interesting to see back when Nicolas Cage was only making AAA Hollywood movies. Yeah, it's like Nicolas Cage was a huge star. It's like you could slap his name on it and it would sell, you know? And he has enough clout to have a glamour shot of his hair. I also think there's an interesting argument that can be made that we romanticize the idea of like the 90s when the specs group market was big and they'd make non-franchise movies, but with... But this movie, I think, is an example of how that is a... It can completely go off the rails. That is a utopian narrative, and you should always be wary of utopian narratives. 
but god damn it i still enjoyed it <laughs> you know what you know what emily said to me when, uh when and, after the plane anybody who likes this movie is racist <laughs> no nope. that's not what she said that's not what she said because you can like something that is racist if you're not racist like gone with the wind right it's a like right, there's racism in that book and that the book kind of supports but the, you can still like it right because yeah, it's yeah. like a story that's people but she said when and i okay so when the plane crashes and then they get on the motorcycles i'm like i am done like i need this to be over she says can you guys pick good movies for your podcast <laughs> And I'm like, History of Violence, Good Night and Good Luck. We have so many good movies. She didn't want to watch those, apparently. She watched Good Night and Good Luck. like that. No quotes from that one. Also, uh, Fire Truck Sequence. It's a fun sequence. I, it's this, too, whole, this whole movie should have been on the fire truck. It's too late in the movie, though. It's it, like, I'm it tired is, now. Yeah, I'm, it, it I want to go like to sleep. a whole other climax of the thing. But... I think they use shit in a clever way. They use the water. They use the raising ladder. They spray the water in the thing. It's like they use the fire truck as like a good set piece. But I completely agree. It's not in the right spot in the movie at all. You know, it's just one more prolonged climax. The only thing I liked left. The only other thing I liked in the movie is when he's looking for first aid. He opens the drawer and it's full of onions and chicken feet. Yep. I'm like, I don't know what that means, but it's kind of funny. <laughs> Big picture. Do you like this movie, and does it work? Does it work? Not really. There's all the problems that we have cited are completely valid with it. I do think this is probably where the big 90s action movie ultimately perished. But I think it went out with a bang. <laughs> it went out with just this stupid fucking this, ride. This and Twister? Yeah, this and Twister. This, this big dumb fucking thing but boy did I enjoy my time watching it and I hate myself for it mm. but not that much because I enjoyed it uh this movie is dumb <laughs> oh it's dumb I do not disagree with and you there's just slightest. no getting around that fact this movie is dumb <laughs> that's it for you got a sequel theory Oh, no. This movie can only live inside itself. That's it for us. I thank Jenny for giving us this pick, this fan-requested episode. Do you thank Jenny for this one? I thank her for giving us this pick. Whatever happens after that, is that's the fate of the universe. So, you know. This episode is written by Kev. Music by Jeff Russell. I am your host, Mr. Jibber Jabber. Kev is your host, Kevin. We are the law. You are the crime. Until next time, thank you for choosing... Speaking cinema, see you in the friendly convict-ridden skies.